Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 346, I continue my conversation with Paul Hales about audio science and immersive sound systems. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded March 23rd, 2017. Episode 346, Audio Science and Immersive Sound. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Grasshopper. Stay connected and run your business from your mobile phone with Grasshopper. To save $50 on your order, visit trygrasshopper.com slash twit. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the home theater geek and editor of avsforum.com. This week, I have brought back Paul Hales, uh, audio expert and founder of Pro Audio Technology, because we had so much to talk about last week that uh, we didn't get through half of it. So now we're going to talk about the other half. Hey, Paul, welcome back. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for having me back. Oh, it's great to have you here. You sent me so many good ideas to talk about, uh, and we only got through some of them last week. So I do encourage those of you who are watching to uh, check out last week's episode. Uh, that would be number 345 uh, to get Paul's comments on uh, speakers, rooms, and EQ curves. And this week we're going to explore some related material. But before we get into it, I want to make sure that those of you who are watching live at live.twit.tv can join the chat room there or at irc.twit.tv. And uh, I'll be watching it. You can post questions for Paul as we go, and I'll pass along as many as I can. It always helps to put my screen name in the message, anywhere in the message. My name, Scott Wilkinson, no spaces or dots or dashes, because then it shows up in a different color on my screen. Um, so, Paul, I one thing we didn't talk about last week was the science of acoustics and audio and how, <laughs> how shall I say it, how uh, uh, undeveloped it is. I mean, people think it's very developed uh, science, but that's not necessarily true, is it? Well, I mean... You know, the, the moving coil loudspeaker, which is the vast majority of loudspeakers we have on the market today, is like 100 years old. So right, from exactly. that perspective, you know, from that perspective, it's a mature it's a mature technology. But uh, the science of um, sort of tying laboratory measurements to human perceived sound or sound quality, that's still pretty crude. You know, we don't we don't have the same resolving power and the same ability uh to to really equate the the engineering and the final result in the way other engineering disciplines do so and and that's why you have so many uh differing opinions in the audio business right there's mm. ev everything we talked about last week is pretty controversial i fall in a camp where i have fairly strong opinions on uh, room-based equalization or system EQ. I think we used system compensation last week. Room, room um, compensation, I think, was the term we ended up with, yeah. Right, right. So room compensation, right. So, um, uh, and others feel entirely differently. They feel like the room really is the arbiter of the final sound quality, and you absolutely have to EQ aggressively uh, based on it. And so how could that be? How could we have people in the same industry that are so differing in opinions. And it really it results from the fact that um, you know, the science, while we've tried hard and we have good engineering and there's good engineers working in the audio world, we're still largely blind. Blind is probably t maybe too strong a word, but we're, we're not nearly as um, able to tie pure engineering to pure um, you know, final subjective perception. Uh, well, isn't that progress. isn't that the problem? Isn't that the the problem though that that we so often run into in in audio that you know there's objective and there's subjective and and this again is a there those are two camps those who rely on objective measurements 
more so and those who rely on subjective impressions for the most part. Uh, and th that leads to many um, spirited discussions, shall we say, on ABS Forum and elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there are there are people who feel like it's purely subjective, that sound quality, people have preferences and they like what they like and maybe they like a little bit extra bass or, or whatever. But um, my feeling is that and because I, I rely heavily on both, like I measure and in the laboratory, I'm super uh, diligent and do everything I can on the engineering side. Uh, but I also include critical listening in the process. It's iterative. You go from the lab to the listening room to the lab to the listening room. And so I, I weigh them both equally. Um, and I have over 30 years been able to uh, tie the laboratory measurements, measurements to what I'm hearing in the listening pretty well. But the measurements do not show in the level of detail what the ear can perceive. Um, so it makes it challenging. And when I'm talking to my non-audio friends, the way I describe it to them is I say, you know, we have a, an iPhone in my pocket, which is basically a computer and a world atlas and a telephone device and a fax machine and a, um, you know, you name it, it talks back to me, it takes commands. Right. Uh, so, so technology in general, um, you know, engineering and science has evolved to the point where we can put all of that in a, in a, in a pants pocket, but, you know, we can't make headphones sound alike like you know what i mean like mm. I, I strikes me strikes me uh particularly that headphones vary so much in sound i would think that with you know with the ability to deliver the sound directly to the ear and i'm not disparaging any headphone designers here but you would think you'd be able to converge upon accurate sound more quickly than through loudspeakers which have to be placed in unknown rooms and acoustic spaces and all that stuff but mm. in my experience Headphones all sound wildly different than each other, um, and, and you don't think and, and you don't think that's that's maybe a design decision by one headphone maker versus another. Of I want the the headphones to sound this way or that way. Well, sure. I mean, Beats is an obvious example that went for a particular sound and took over the world doing right. it. But but the the ones I'm talking about are the ones that tend to be deemed to reference. You know, the two, three, four, five thousand dollar headphones that are supposed mm. to be. You know, world reference headphones. I've been for, you know, 20 years looking for a headphone that I could use as a reference during my loudspeaker design, and um, and I have yet to find one that I thought was, uh, you know, high resolution and uncolored in any way. They all have some coloration, and uh, if so, and I think that that's a natural uh, um, result of what I'm talking about. Is we still uh, can't. At, in an absolute sense, tie measure measurements to uh, perceived sound quality, uh, and then of course, as you mentioned, there is there is subjective personal preference in there too, which you can never account for that. But for for most people, and I think even untrained listeners, we do tend to gravitate towards accuracy. If we hear a speaker that's accurate, even untrained listeners will tell you they like it because it sounds right to them. Um, so uh, if you if you define high high quality. Uh, loudspeaker as an accurate loudspeaker, then that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. What about Harman's uh, research into, I guess they're calling it, I can't remember exactly, it's the room curve or the ideal room curve for headphones now. We're talking about headphones. They, uh, Harman has been trying to um, determine or specify Sort of a, a, a an EQ curve or something that would give you what you're what you're talking about. That is more consistency across headphones. Have you right. have you looked into that much? A little bit, yeah. I actually know Todd, who's done a lot of that work, um, and it's good they're doing that because I think the whole industry will benefit from that. And I, I don't don't quote me on this, but my understanding was what they did is they uh, measured using a dummy head. They measured what a pair of uh, acknowledgeably good loudspeakers uh, measured like for the dummy. And because that curve has all of the transfer function of the inner ear, you have the pinna and you have your ear, ear and everybody's a little bit different, but mm -hmm. it, it, it causes a transfer function to the sound. So flat loudspeaker, if you measure it at the eardrum, is no longer a flat curve. And so they've tried to identify through measuring sort of how speakers you know, good speakers respond to measurements made in the ear like that, as well as headphones, and converge upon a 
a target curve that manufacturers ought to use. And if they start to use it, they'll start to converge and the, and the sound, I think, will improve and become more similar. Uh, I'm not sure that they're completely done, but that is what they're doing. And it's good they're doing it because um, because the ear changes this curve so much, it's very hard to know what's good anymore because it's not flat anymore. You can't just say, oh, I want a flat straight line. It's a it's a funny shaped curve. Uh, anybody right. who's seen and it's going to be different for each person because, as you said, the the outer ear and the ear canal and so on are different, are individual. They're unique for each of us in a way. That's right. So, but if you think about it, that's always the case, right? So, yeah. if I listen to a piano and you listen to a piano, you might per be perceiving it slightly different than me, but that's accurate for you, and and my perception is accurate for me. So. So that's the good news, right? Uh, otherwise, all bets would be off. We couldn't tailor right. we couldn't tailor the sound for everybody's ear. Um, so you can kind of. It, that's why I question a little bit measuring um, headphones using a dummy head because they model. They have little uh, devices that kind of mimic the the acoustic impedance of people's ear. You know, average person's ear. And I wonder if that isn't a mistake. I wonder if there isn't a way you could remove that from the equation because you can't control that and you know by definition you're calling it an average so you know that it's not right for everybody maybe somehow determining um what a flat response uh I, i'm not sure how you do it because you have to account for yeah. the loading the, the, the loading of the person's head and the acoustic impedance of the person's head but i'm not i don't not i'm not sure if i'm convinced that putting the ear model in there makes total sense but nonetheless that's the way they do it in the curves anybody who's seen the measurements of headphones they look crazy <laughs> and and they're wildly different you know if you go to um headphone.com or whatever the big uh, online headphone re resellers they have a, a, a utility in there that lets you graph the measurements of different headphones maybe if you're oh considering really buying. oh is that head uh no it's uh i think headphone.com it's um oh. It's, uh, you know, an online retailer that has measured all their products and you can plot one against the other and you'll see that they vary wildly. They're just all over the place. And I think that is what, uh, you know, that's what attributes to the different sound quality. Um, I'm, after 30 years of doing this, I'm of the belief that the amplitude response absolutely dominates our perceived sound quality. It is just the first and foremost thing that we hear. And the headphones have very wildly different amplitude responses, and that's why they sound so different. Uh, by amplitude response, you mean frequency response. Uh, so oh, the, okay, all right. So the, the what, what is the amplitude given? Given say pink noise, uh, how does the frequency response vary f from low frequencies to high frequencies in terms of amplitude at each frequency? That's what you mean. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, you know, spectral content, you can think of mm -hmm. it like that. How is the content across the spectrum, uh, the energy uh, distributed? And you want it to be equal. If you put in a flat signal, you want it to come out flat. Uh, and variations in that amplitude response, in my opinion, are, are most of what we perceive as different sonically. You know, we, we're not that sensitive to phase. That's mm -hmm. another one of those. That's another one of those sort of controversial topics in audio where not everybody falls into the same camp. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Certainly, we're we're sensitive to when phase change during the time that phase changes. I mean, there. Uh, when I was working with synthesizers a lot, there was a phase shifter, right? And you can hear it. You can definitely hear that. But once it stops, you can't. You, there's no way to tell what the phase is set to, right? Right. And what I'm referring to is, uh, you know, loudspeakers. For the most part, multi-way loudspeakers, the vast majority of them, they're not linear phase. They do shift phase with respect to frequency. Mm. And there have been a few uh, over time that don't do that, um, uh, but they're in the minority. And if if the phase was really important, you can imagine that those speakers that, that had linear phase behavior would just outperform all the others and it would be easy to detect, right? And right. that's not my experience. Some of the, you know, the best speakers I've ever heard uh, tend to be the type that have higher order crossovers and uh, they're not one way, you know, they're multi-way speakers. So uh, it's just not been my experience that we are that sensitive to that. Um, I, I once read in a book, I think it was a studio uh, 
how to build a recording studio book that, uh, and he used the analogy of, um, you know, you can imagine a large gong. Now I've never really been in front of a large gong, but you know, four foot in diameter Mm -hmm. gong. Um, if you were to stand right in front of it and strike it with a mallet, um, you would be getting uh, lots of low frequency energy, but you get all the harmonics too. There's a bunch of high frequency energy in there. Yep, and uh, it's kind of coming at you from all surfaces of the of the gong. And if you were to move your head just slightly to the side, uh, my intuition tells me that the timbre is not going to change that much. That the sound of the gong is going to stay sort of the sound of the gong. Mm-hmm. But I would agree. I, do- I have stood in front of a large gong, not to do this particular experiment, but you know, I, I can certainly say that you move a little bit one way or the other, the sound doesn't change particularly. Yeah. Yeah, and at the high frequencies, because it, they're com- it's coming from all surfaces of the, you know, the entire surface of this large instrument, uh, mm-hmm. the phase response of those different different points on the gong is going to change dramatically, right? Because the we talked last week about how uh, wavelength of sound in the high frequencies is sh- small. So if you mm-hmm. move a few inches, that could be significant phase shift. So, so I just I just don't feel like that's it's not completely unimportant but it's not at the top of the list you know it's mm. third or fourth down the list something like that <laughs> uh okay good well basically i wanted to start off by talking a little bit about about your contention that audio per se is so full of dogma shall we say or belief and um trying to trying to even that out with measurement can work to some degree, but there's still going to be that there, right? That's right. So, you know, audio is full of a lot of sort of misinformation. Unfortunately, uh, there's been some long held beliefs that maybe weren't based in reality, but they became accepted. Uh, there's, um, unfortunately there's things we can measure. Uh, so we can certainly, you know, identify them in the graphs that maybe during, real listening that aren't important. So you've got to be able to know what measurements relate directly to us listening to real content. And that's, mm-hmm. that's the key thing there is the stuff that we measure in sound from steady state uh, signals uh, likely doesn't apply or may not apply when the, the content is a real piece of music or, or a real movie transient content, you know, right. One, one because, thing, because the steady state is just the same over time and the real content changes over time. So that's a very different situation. That's right. So things like, um, it, you know, comes to mind, uh, um, comb filters, you, know, you can get comb filters from any number of, uh, sources. We experience comb filters virtually every day. If you're in a reflective environment, you hear your voice, it bounces off the wall right next to me here. And then, it ref- comes back in uh, and creates comb filters. And so during conversations, you know, whenever you're in an acoustic reverberant environment, we experience comb filters. If why, don't you you first, paint- why don't you explain uh, uh, what comb filters are so that everyone is on the same page? Okay, so if you were st- if you were having a conversation with a person near a wall, say, um, the sound of your voice would go from your mouth directly to the, your, the listener's ears. Uh, and then some energy would... Uh, travel over to the wall, bounce off, and arrive at the listener listener's ears with some delay. And the delay causes the phase to be different uh, with the arrival sound. And so you get uh, destructive interference at, at certain frequencies. And it kind of has certain a pattern. frequencies. That's the key. That's right. So you get this pattern of notches in the response if you were to measure uh, at the listener's ears in that case. And they tend to be very deep not very wide and they're spaced according to the the time delay determines sort of the frequency spacing of these notches and I, if you google it i'm sure you'll see lots of graphics well if and you in put, fact the, the, that that response curve kind of looks like a comb which is where the name comes from exactly um and if you uh put pink noise on or you put a steady state signal on and you listen you can actually hear this uh quite easily by moving your head just a little bit you'll you'll hear the the notches come and go but when this, the tra- when the when the content is transient in nature, music or movies, we can't hear it. First of all, the content is changing constantly, so it never really builds up the notch. Uh, you know, the content at that frequency comes and goes. Now it's gone, and the signal's at a different place, so they just never right. really form. 
Uh, and also we experience in them re- routinely all day long. Like if you're sitting at a conference table in a meeting uh, at work, everybody's getting getting comb filters off the table. Um, and well, I think yeah, but if but if everybody's talking and and the sound is changing all the time, are they really hearing a comb filter? Well, that's the thing is is it, it, it would be there, but it would be like with because it is changing, they don't they don't build up, and if if they do, we don't we've learned to not be bothered by them. High hmm. cue phenomena, we don't really detect. Our ears are kind of like a in a way they kind of integrate the sound a little bit. So if you have a very high Q peak, for example, in a, in a flat, otherwise flat response. So high Q means narrow in frequency, but, but high in amplitude. Uh, we don't, it's hard for us to hear those. And it's also hard to excite those. Like the content has to be right at that frequency uh, for a period of time to actually hit that resonance. And it doesn't really happen. And so we're not bothered by that. But if you had a low, uh, broad peak, uh, that is you know, quite audible. And usually uh, if it's a low broad peak on an otherwise flat response, it's unpleasant. It's not, it's Mm. never, ever a positive direction on the sound. So, so the moral there is just because we can measure it doesn't mean that, that it, uh, the the results of those measurements ought to play into how we uh, set up the sound system because Mm, that's pretty interesting. So comb filters, if you, if you, well, that's, so let me give you a perfect example. Not too long ago, I was talking to a consultant who still preferred bipole surround speakers. And, um, which and used bipole, to be the very common way, common type of speaker to put in the surround positions, bipoles that send the sound in two opposite directions, creating a very diffuse sound. That's right. And they were kind of, they were kind of invented to address, uh, this would have been before AC3 ProLogic or even before that. I, I, I was in the hi-fi business then, so I don't know much about surround. But when the, when the surround signal was mono, if you didn't have diffuse surround speakers, it would, the virtual image would just be in your head if you were sitting in the middle of the room, right? So mm-hmm. they wanted to make it diffuse so that it didn't seem, so it didn't seem like a mono signal. But now we know, especially with the immersive formats, directivity is exactly what you want, right? You want the sound to come as it moves throughout the 3D space, you want it to be uh, reproduced by speakers that are highly, not not directional, but highly um, uh, direct uh, yeah. sound field so that you can get a precise virtual image. And uh, and the reason this consultant said he preferred the, the bipoles was to prevent comb filters. And, and so the problem there is the bipole speakers uh, don't have good frequency response on the axis you want them to, right? They're, <laughs> they're kind of the sending the sound down the wall in both directions, and the sound that comes out towards the listeners doesn't measure very well. Um, mm. And you, if you remember from last week, I'm a, direct, I'm a big believer in we key into the direct sound, and the direct sound is the most important. And so in making that decision, you're throwing away the direct sound in favor of trying to prevent comb filters, right? That's the trade-off. Mm. Whereas if, if you think comb filters aren't that important for real-time, real content, you don't need to worry about that. You don't need to throw that out. That's right. That's right. So uh, hard, what makes this the, the job of deploying a complex system like this so hard is knowing stuff like that, knowing how to make those trade-offs and what matters and what doesn't. Uh, we had a system one time where um, our speakers have very high efficiency. The the tweeters in our systems are 110 to 114 dB sensitivity for one watt. Wow! So they're they're very good at revealing noise floor, right? <laughs> a dome tweeter might be 90 dB. Uh, so if your noise floor uh, is you know whatever it is, ours is about minus 80 dBV or something like that. Um, you know, you're not going to hear any noise out of a out of a dome tweeter speaker, but when when you've got uh, 24 more dB of sensitivity, uh, you know, noise becomes a challenge. And so we had a client that um, was very sensitive to the noise, and the dealer um, had measured the room and measured this resonance in some of the uh, cabinets that were built into the room at like 25 hertz or something, and you know, because he had. He had the equipment and he he swept a sine wave and he heard some vibrations and stuff. And so in an effort to 
get rid of the 25 hertz resonance, he inserted a multiband EQ, which raised the noise floor even more. Mm. And so he was prioritizing the 25 hertz vibration uh, in over the noise. And, um, you know, I, I talked to him about it and I said, well, you're raising the noise floor and we know the client is sensitive to noise. That might not be the best decision. And the, the, the resonance is actually easy to deal with um, because, again, you'd have to have energy right at 25 hertz to excite it. And we can, we can damp the, the vibrations of the, of the cabinetry uh, without having to have an audio EQ solution. So, so I, I think it's just important that people realize that there's a lot of, it's a complex situation. There's a lot of confusion. There's some misinformation out there. Um, uh, one of the things, bass is non-directional. Uh, I don't believe that to be true. I think that with steady state signals, yes, you put on a sine wave uh, at you know, 40 hertz and you, it's very difficult to locate the source of the speaker. You would find the speaker. You know, If you blindfolded somebody and told them to go find a, a subwoofer with a sine wave playing, they probably could never find it. But um, mm. but if you put on real content, he'd be able to walk right over and sit down on the sub. So really, yeah. So uh, especially if there's any kind of concussive uh, energy coming off the well, off true. The and and you know, like for example, playing a low bass, you know, a bass guitar or something, you're going to hear the the sound of the pick or at least some higher harmonics that are going to cue right. you into where it is. Exactly. So you walk into a jazz club and you've got a jazz trio playing and the guy's playing the stand-up bass, you know right where the stand-up bass is, right? So mm -hmm. it might be this, the, you know, the, the transient plucks of the string or the, vib the higher, higher harmonic vibration of the soundboard. But nonetheless, low frequency sounds tend to not be single sine waves. They tend to be complex waveforms, including higher harmonics. Plus, there is the concussive uh, sort of impact of the bass that you can tell direction from too. I, if you if you remember three and a half years ago, the get the kick drum out of my butt talk we had, <laughs> that, that was that was uh, that was a case where there wasn't any directionality in the bass and it just vibrated the chair and that was just completely unnatural. So when we right. talked uh, about EQing the you know, immersive audio formats, we'll talk about uh, sort of complex bass management and th this is precisely why it works so well is because we do sense where the bass is coming from. Um, mm, okay. You know, uh, yeah, you know, we used to we used to demonstrate this uh, using the old the original THX trailer. Remember the THX trailer where it just kind of goes. Yeah, yeah. And, there's there's a, and if, there's a whole there's a like a a, a bunch of frequencies kind of converge onto one note. Yeah, and it starts off. There's a bunch of low energy in it and high energy and high frequency energy. Mm -hmm. And and we were we we're using the demonstration to show um, why we didn't like bass management. You know, we designed the speakers here to meet this commercial cinema spec, which is full range surrounds. And if you use bass management, typically, especially at that at the time we did this, which was you know ten years ago or something like that. Um, you, know, you typically have a couple subwoofers in the front on the screen wall, but then that's all the subs you would have. So if you use bass management and you redirected the low frequency energy from the surrounds to the front subwoofers in that THX trailer, you could tell the bass was at the front wall. But mm. when we when we turned bass management off, you were immersed in this full range sound. It was a very cool experience. You had that that trailer sound and it was just all around you including the low frequency energy. And it was easy, it was easy to hear. It was easy to perceive. It wasn't uh, and that's not even a transient kind of sound. That's more of a steady state kind of sound really in the bass. So um, I, I just, I, I, I do believe that steady state bass is omnidirectional and hard to localize, but that real bass music and movies is not. Mm. Very, very point, very well taken. Absolutely. Uh, before we go on, uh, Emily the Strange had a couple questions I wanted to just bring up here. Uh, first one is, does that apply to radio waves too? I assume you mean comb filtering. And as far as I know, the yes, the answer is yes. And in fact, that's why you sometimes get situation where as you're driving along, say, in your car, you, the signal might come in and out if you're in, say, downtown, big city, something like that. I mean, that would be comb filtering, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, any wave, uh, you know, that we talked last week about how physics is physics is physics. So the exactly. physics that, the, yes. you know, yeah, so that's good news for us, actually. There's no special audio physics or anything. Right. Um, so, yeah, sound waves, you know, sine waves, uh, whether they're light waves or sound waves or uh, radio ocean waves. waves, yeah, water waves, uh, they summon 
they they interfere and and constructively sum together in the same using the same laws, right? Yep, exactly right. And then Emily also asks, uh, do hear do human ears adapt for sudden change in sound, like how our eyes adjust to bright and dark? I don't know if you if you know much about that particular thing. I do know that there is a reflex that if there's a sudden loud sound, really loud, compared to what you've been listening to, your ear kind of clamps down on the the inner, the middle ear parts of of the hearing system to protect. Uh, so in that sense, there is, but I don't think there is quite like there is with the eyes where, you know, you walk, you, you're in a dark theater, you walk out into the bright sunlight and your eyes, you know, kind of take a little bit to adapt. You, it hurts a little bit unless yeah, you know something about that. I don't. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that we become more sensitive. Like if we had a faint sound, I don't think the, there's no aperture like in your eye that can determine right. how much light it lets in. Um, but you're, I, I've heard what you've heard too about the trying to protect itself. And I think the ringing actually uh, after you've experienced like a rock concert or whatever has a little bit to do with that, right? Mm. Isn't, well, certainly, isn't that a yeah. result of the protection mechanism or something? I'm I'm not sure. No, I, it, it's my, as far as I know, and I have studied this some, I'm not an audiologist, but it, the it actually is from some damage to the inner ear, the hair cells or cilia that uh, get damaged uh, when hit by very high volumes, levels, and uh, that can be temporary damage or that can be permanent damage. And once it's permanent, there ain't no ain't no cure for the summertime ringing in the ears. I'll tell you that right now. Yeah, well, my Celia are probably not very happy with me. Then. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to a rock concert or two in my day. Yep, me too. Me too. I played a few rock concerts in my day. Well, uh, you mentioned immersive audio, and that's where I want to go next. And we've got a lot to talk about there. But before we do, I would like to thank, take a moment to thank our sponsor for this episode, which is Grasshopper. Grasshopper is a virtual phone system designed for entrepreneurs. Grasshopper works just like a traditional phone system, but it requires no hardware purchase. With their iOS and Android app, callers can reach you wherever you are on your mobile phone. Grasshopper allows you to keep your existing number so you can maintain your brand. When you make a call, your client will see your Grasshopper caller ID instead of your personal phone number. Simply select a toll-free or local number, record a custom greeting, and add multiple extensions for your business. Toll-free numbers are great for marketing and making your business sound more professional. You can set up department and employee extensions with custom call forwarding to any phone in the world. You can also get voicemails emailed to you as audio attachments, and you can send and receive SMS text messages from your business number. So join the over 250,000 Grasshopper customers today. Plans start at just $12 a month, and you have a 30-day money-back guarantee. So turn your smartphone into a business line with Grasshopper. To save $50 on your order, go to trygrasshopper.com slash twit. That's trygrasshopper.com slash twit. And we thank Grasshopper very much for their support of Home Theater Geeks. Paul, I believe you use Grasshopper, don't you? I do, yeah. It works, works quite well for our situation. We're kind of a virtual company. We have... Uh people scattered across the United States, a sales manager in Texas and some engineers in Northern California. I'm in Southern California. And so it's, it's a great way to have one phone system that pulls us all together seamlessly. Like when you call, you don't know that we're all uh, scattered about. Scattered about the country. It sounds like you're all in one office. I love it. That's yep. super cool. Um, okay, so we were going to talk about uh, immersive audio, and I want to make sure we have plenty of time to do that. And you mentioned the importance of bass management in immersive audio. You had just said that you didn't think it was necessarily that important, specific, particularly because bass actually does have some directionality to it when you're listening to real content. Of course, you have to have speakers that can reproduce it if you're going to do full range in your surrounds. Uh, how does immersive audio change the situation? Well, essentially, uh, it's the sa our our belief is exactly the same. The difference is immersive audio because of the nature of them uh, of the systems. The the surround speakers and ceiling speakers now tend to be small, 
which means they do have restricted low frequency. So if you if you had large surround speakers that had full range capability, then you wouldn't need the bass management I'm talking about. But that's not reality in most people's home home theaters, and so I, I guess I, I'm thinking about you know putting a full a true full range speaker on your ceiling. It would have to be really big and heavy, and you'd have to be very careful mounting multiple ones of them on your ceiling. Yeah, we've had some people put some 180 pound subs in the ceiling, and it's a it's a challenge for sure. Um, Man, but uh, so we're we're recommending surround subwoofers, uh, multiple surround subwoofers so that you can base manage locally. So that's that's the difference is we're not talking about base managing to the front wall. We're talking about base managing to a sub near the other speakers that you're doing the base management to. So immersive audio last week, you know, the message last week was essentially um, we we live our lives in rooms. We are used to being in rooms. We expect the room to be there. We largely adapt to the room. So the strategy that we found it's best for system, you know, home theater system deployment is to uh, to get the room design, uh, acoustically speaking, right, uh, address the acoustics in the acoustic domain by the best loudspeakers you can. And at that point, f except for the low frequencies, there shouldn't really be the need for much system level EQ or room compensation. You should compensate primarily for the the stuff that the 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 areas that the room uh, that the room impacts the direct sound. So that would be low frequency boundary loading, you know, low frequency reinforcement. And if there's any interior design materials that come between the the listener and the speaker. So if you put something over the speaker front, uh, whether it's a perforated video screen or cloth that stretched fabric uh, stretch fabric on the wall, then mm -hmm. you're gonna want to you're gonna want to compensate for that. But but you really shouldn't have to do much more broadband, you know, 200 hertz and up EQ. Immersive changes that a little bit, and again, that's because of the nature of uh, how many speakers we now have and where they're located. So the 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 base management that I'm talking about and the the need for some system level EQ that I'm talking about results from the fact that there are more speakers now and listeners are sitting oftentimes quite far off axis of many of those speakers. So, and this applies mostly to what I'll call high channel count Atmos. The 7.1.4, where you're really just adding four ceiling speakers to, uh, to 7.1, it's mm -hmm. less critical. Uh, the base management could help, but the the EQ is not as important because typically you're you are within the sort of direct sound of the ceiling speakers. But we have been selling uh, twenty one to even thirty one channel uh, Atmos systems, and when you do that, uh, um, you you start to have speakers that are that are quite far off axis from where the listeners are. Um, so we should talk a bit about the Dolby specification. Uh, the Atmos specification calls for the speakers to be uh, like a, you can imagine a horizontal ring around the room. Um, they pretty much want speakers spaced evenly all the way around all four surfaces, uh, across the front, left, center, right, and then all the way down the side, across the back, and all the way up to the front again. So mm -hmm. we, we now have speakers that are well in front of the front seats. Um, and then on the ceiling, they kind of want two lines of speakers going from the back of the room all the way to the screen, uh, kind of equidistant off the center line. So you can imagine two stripes of speakers uh, down the ceiling. And if would it, if would, you it go help, to, would it help while you're ta describing this to look at that little movie we that you sent me? Sure. Yeah. Why not? Um, Let's take a look at uh, Atmos speaker layout. Uh, it's a, a short little movie with no no uh, audio. So go ahead. So the uh, this is a system that we uh, uh, put together for a client. Uh, it's 31 channels, and um, you can see the wall on the right there, the front of those three speakers. That's the left, center, right, and then we're seeing the right side of the room here, and you can see the scale. This is a large home cinema. Those those crash test dummies are six feet tall, so that's how big that room is. But you can see we now have uh, side speakers all the way down the side wall. Uh, and then I've moved the left and right wide speakers to the front wall because in this case I could do that. And we'll talk about why I did that. Um, mm -hmm. But that those speakers just outside the left and right speakers, those could be, uh, in many cases, if the screen goes wall to wall, then you, you're forced to put those on the side walls. And, and those are just firing straight across the front of the screen. Uh, and then you can see on the ceiling there's uh, 10 
10, I think 10 loudspeakers. Um, starting two at rows the back, of five. Two rows of five, that's right. The, the, the ones near the rear here that are closest to us and the ones that are farthest away near the screen, those are angled. So they angle, the baffle's angled and it aims the sound back at the listening area. So that helps a bit. Um, and then the ones, the three that are in the middle, those fire straight down. But they're so high, the, the, the ones that fire straight down, pretty much everybody on the couches is going to be in the direct sound. Um, mm -hmm. And then the tall, slender boxes on the sidewalls, two on each side, those are subwoofers. Those are local subwoofers to base manage the surround speakers, too. Mm -hmm. So that's what a kind of a high-end residential uh Dolby Atmos system looks like it's it's uh, you know it's 31 channels uh, you know that right now the only processor that will do that is the Trinov and I think they just increase it or this this fall they're going to increase the channel count to 48. Um, mm. So we'll actually fact, be able in to. In fact, Mike Heiss uh, in the chat room is asking uh, what type of speakers are using are you're using in there and is it a DCI based setup or using a consumer processor? I think you just you just answer that last part of the question that it's a trin off which is a very high-end consumer processor right that's right and we do get a number of dci systems each year too uh usually entertainment industry folks uh there's actually it's it's happening more and more we're seeing commercial equipment being installed into into homes uh the by ones the way, that we've by done the way just for those who don't know dci stands for digital cinema initiative which refers mostly to commercial cinemas where you'd go out to the movies to an AMC or whatever. Uh, but now, as you say, some very high-end clients are starting to put that kind of system in their home. That's right. And the, the so far, the rooms we've done, uh, the channel count's similar to the one I just showed. It's around 30 loudspeakers or so. You know, the, the rooms, uh, most home theater rooms are just not much bigger, you know, big enough to require much more than that. Although... We, we've got a number of celebrity clients, which I'm, I'm, I'm fortunately not allowed to talk about. And we did a, a large system for um, a woman that everybody knows and loves. And and her room probably could could use, you know, 40 or 50 loudspeakers. I think it was. Oh, only 30. man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but so so the answer to the question is that was a turn off uh, consumer processor it, it because it's a computer based it, it is basically a PC inside. It has the ability to process up to 32 right now, discrete channels. And then in the fall, it's going to jump to 48. Uh, the consumer processors, at least for the time being, which are based on DSP chips, really have a 12 channel limit. They can't process simultaneously any more than 12 discrete channels. So um, all these high channel count ones we're doing uh, have been based around the trend off. But as time goes on, uh, there's already a chip that analog devices introduced that has twice the computing power of the prior chips. So uh, you will see after they, the companies have had time to develop their uh, Atmos codecs so that uh, the consumer uh, level, the more affordable consumer level processors will likely be able to handle more channels. And the, and the way the, the, the Blu-ray encodes the, the signal is the, the 118 objects that they can have in their um, in their mix, sound objects, they're all present. And so the more channels you have, the better it gets. Um, I, when, when people come for a demonstration here in our experience center, um, I like to explain it like video. Like, I think we all have an intuitive understanding of video resolution, right? Um, the more pixel density you have, the greater resolving power. So if I'm trying to resolve these flowers over here, where's the over there mm, over there yeah. Um, <laughs> if, the, if you have more pixels you can do a crisper sharper rendition of the um of the of the flowers so true cameras. down to down to a certain point where the human eye can no longer perceive any greater detail it, yeah i mean my look at my i have an iphone 7 i marvel at that screen because i'm like wow there's no pixels on there but um yeah but where I'm going with this is I, I say now with immersive audio, with object-oriented audio, you can kind of think of speakers as sound pixels. Um, and the, oh, and that's the more, interesting. I don't think I'd ever heard that before. That's great. Yeah, so the more pixels you have, the more speakers you have, the better the Atmos rendering is. And we've got 23 channels upstairs, and it's quite, it's quite good. I mean, it, you're just sitting in this very cohesive, very contiguous sound all around you. You don't perceive the loca location of any speaker. You're just immersed in, in the sound. 
uh, of the movie. And it, it sucks you into the scene because whereas before it kind of, you could see the, you could see the video on the screen and you had some sounds coming at you from the side in the back because they came from speakers and you knew where the speakers were. It, it, it was more like you were listening to a surround system. Now with this distribution of speakers kind of all around you, that sound field is, is, is no longer associated with the presence of loudspeakers. And when you can't see them, now you're just immersed in sound that would be real for the, for the scene that you're watching. And it's, it's really good. I mean, it's, um, I've said this, I don't know if I said this last week or not, Scott, but you know, I've been in this business for 30 years and I've never been more excited about any, any new technology, uh, as I am for, uh, this object oriented, uh, surround sound, the Atmos, it is just fantastic. It's, it's mm -hmm. so much better than what we've had. It's, it's leaps and bounds better. So, now, uh, uh, Mike Heiss in the chat room is also asking, uh, you've been men mentioning Atmos, and that is, I think, the most common immersive format, but it's not the only one. And he's wondering if you've heard Oro 3D and what you think of that. Yeah, I have. And, and it's important to distinguish right now, anyway, the uh, Atmos is the only one that's object-oriented. Uh, Oro 3D and DTSX, at least as they, I believe, as they are today, are still channel-based. So they require speakers to be mounted in a particular location, and sounds when when they mix the uh, when they mix the uh, the content, they map sounds to individual loudspeaker locations. Well, so, I, I know that I know that DTSX has some object orient orientation to it, and Oro just recently sort of added that on. So they are moving in that direction, but I don't that, think that's either. Right. Uh, well, DTSX started out as MDA, multi-dimensional audio, and that was purely object-oriented as well. But that was more of a of a creation system, not a playback system. Yeah, right. And so this is actually a good a good little piece of information. My understanding, and I and I got this information from the CEO of Trinov, and he's pretty plugged into the the movie business. My understanding is is at the commercial level, because historically movie theaters had to have a, a DTS processor and a Dolby processor and a whatever processor. Uh, mm -hmm. And in order to avoid that situation in the future, my understanding was that they were going to use MDA as a way to deliver all three formats, Oro, DTSX, and Dolby, oh. so that they could have one processor that uh, processed all of them. And then for the uh, for the consumer, it would be like it has been historically, where when you buy the Blu-ray, you buy you can buy the DTS one, or you can buy the Atmos one, or you can buy the Oro one, or maybe sometimes they would have both. Um, <clears throat> but I think that that's, and I think you're right. They're they are moving towards object-oriented formats, um, and and that's when it gets really good. Um, we do demos here with Oro. Uh, one of the features of the Trinov that makes it very powerful is it knows precisely where your speakers are. Uh, it measures using a matrix microphone. Uh, it localizes the speaker uh, within like one inch or something. It knows the angle, the azimuth, and the distance. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have an Oro format, it will remap the sound according to where your speakers are anyway. So right. we have an Atmos configuration. When we play Oro back here, the the processor handles the remapping for us so that it, the sounds come from where the Oro mix wants them to come from. And mm -hmm. they're very good too. I mean, it's a it's a super good uh, technology. I, I really like it for music because I, th I think the Oro has been spent a little bit more time capturing music than, of course, Dolby is, is theatrical and always been about a movie sound movies yeah um, but we have some uh some music where the you know the left center and right are used to to reproduce the sound of the orchestra or the instrument or whatever the con main content and then the surrounds are largely just used to recreate the reverberation of the space and the ambience you know, of the space yeah yeah, and it's a very it's a very convincing illusion um, i mean if you close your eyes and the, let the thing play. And then when it's done, you open your eyes. It's kind of startling because you realize that these surfaces are close to you and you feel like you're in this massive concert hall. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, heard so some, it's, I've heard some of their recordings too, and I'm very impressive. Yeah, it's, very, it's a very good technology. I think I just did a demo yesterday and the, the, the woman that was here was um, primarily interested in music and I was encouraging her to consider surround sound because she just really wanted stereo. 
And, mm. and I, I encouraged her for that reason, because when we played the Oro music, it's so much more believable. I mean, it sounds real. And then you play stereo and it just sounded flat and kind of lifeless as, as mm -hmm. in comparison. So, In fact, you know, I know a I, number of people, Mark Henninger, my colleague at AVS Forum being one of them, who enjoys taking stereo recordings and using the Dolby surround up mixer to spread mm -hmm. that out into the entire Oro sound field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, we used to we used to recommend people to use Prologic 2 music, which could kind of do that too. It would give you a surround effect without kind of destroying the the intent of the music mm -hmm. on the front wall too. Right, so. exactly. A right. couple more questions from the chat room. Uh, iPhone uh, 23622 uh, asks, what is the ultimate channel count for Atmos to get the full effect? I, I think you you mentioned it. It's something like... In infinite. Go oh, it's infinite? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the more the merrier. But um, there there is a practical limitation. So the, the commercial cinema spec is 64 speakers. So the Dolby processor um, will allow up to 64 discrete channels. Um, the trend of right now is 32. They're going to be able to support 48 pretty soon. And by the time, in my experience, by the time you get in a, in a, in a, in a in, you know, kind of a home theater size room, by the time you get above, let's say 20 or so, um, 20 to 32, it's really quite good at that point. And, you know, it's diminishing returns beyond that. Exactly. In fact, that relates to UJ's question. Would you say the minimum amount of speakers for an Atmos setup, what would you say is the minimum number of speakers in an Atmos setup so that the listener would not be able to distinguish individual speakers? Yeah, that, that's going to occur somewhere between the 12 and the and like 20. I would say, you know, um, it's going to be near 20, something like that, um, because the 7.1.4 to me, um, I can always locate the the ceiling speakers and it always comes off to me as, oh, yeah, somebody stuck some speakers on the ceiling. Um, <laughs> when you get up around 20 so that you have at least six on the ceiling um, and you have more uh, surround you know, on the side, down the sides. Mm -hmm. um, and you have some wides that can really bring the sound off the screen and wrap it into the sound field, then then it gets pretty good. So I'm going to say 20 or so. And it's always an odd number, right? Because we have a center channel and usually even number of subs. So it's 21-ish. Mm -hmm. um, so 21.1 or 2 or 3 or 4, depending on the number of subwoofers. Or not yeah, 21 well, I, dot, but um, uh, say 15 dot four dot six you know yeah or, you know, yeah eleven dot four dot eight something like that you know you're mm -hmm. gonna need uh at least four subwoofers you've got to have at least two subwoofers in the back and um you're gonna have at least six on the front so that's 10 channels so if you had 11 that'd be 21 i'm thinking it's that eleven dot four dot six mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh iphone 23 20, 6, 22 was asked, how do you break that up? And that's exactly how you do it. Now, I am special, uh, post something here that I wanted to, that takes us to really our next topic, which is you were talking about how the direct sound is the most important, and you were uh, talking about a aiming the overhead Atmos speakers toward the listening position so that they get the direct sound. And mm -hmm. I am special's question is, but doesn't that limit the sweet spot? Uh, well, yeah, that's a good question. It doesn't really limit the sweet spot because the speakers will end up being far enough away. The ones that are aimed the most are far enough away that the dispersion at, by the time they get to the listening area is probably going to cover all, you know, both couches in our video. Like if we look at the video again, or actually there's, there's graphics that show the speaker exactly, dispersion. Exactly. What I wanted to, sh wanted to get to next was the dispersion graphics. Um, so yeah, let's look at dispersion 7.1. Okay, yeah. So in 7.1, for example, this is a typical setup. You can see that there's the surround speakers are located, you know, the black boxes are the surround are the surround speakers. They're located such that pretty much everybody on both couches is going to be in the direct sound of those two speakers. There's gray lines that indicate the dispersion of those boxes. They're kind of faint, but if you look closely... They're kind of faint, yeah, but we should be able to see them. Yeah, and you'll notice that if, if somebody's in the back chair, like where the, the dummy is there, um, if he was way off to the 
armrest uh, on the left side there, he might be out of the direct sound of the frontmost side speaker, but he'd have another speaker right next to him that, that's playing the same signal, right? So mm -hmm. in 7.1, the two speakers on the right and the two speakers on the left walls are playing the same signal. Right. Um, so, you know, we, we put the speakers in the listening area, right? Um, now that's not the case. So if we look at the Atmos version of this. Which is the next one. It is called um, Dispersion, Dispersion Wide Front. Dispersion six uh, fifteen point six point ten wide front. Yeah, actually, there's one that shows the 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 fronts on the side wall that's e even better. Okay, um, well that's then the next one. Dispersion fifteen point six point ten wide side. Right. Okay. So that's an exaggerated position. Those sides, those the side speakers near the screen there should not be crammed into the corner. That's just an uh, uh, artifact of the way I set up my model. But um, you can see what happens. The speakers on the side that are in front of the listening area, now no one, almost no one is going to be in the direct sound of those loudspeakers. And so, you know, smartly, Dolby says the to meet the Dolby spec, you have to aim the speakers back at the listening position. So you can imagine if you rotated those speakers back towards the and what they define as the reference listening position is in the middle of the room, uh, two thirds of the way back in the listening area. So since this has two rows of couches, two thirds of the way back would be like the front edge of the couch, essentially. So if you of the aim front those, couch, you mean, or the rear of couch? The, of the rear rear couch, yeah, sorry, uh -huh. uh, the rear couch. So if you aim those speakers back at that, you know, you can imagine a, a point in the center of the front edge of the rear couch. The dispersion will be so wide because it's so far away. The couch is so far away from the speaker. Everybody's mm -hmm. going to get pretty much the direct sound. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that is the best solution. So, if your house will tolerate aiming, um, then do it by all means because then your EQ needs will be much less. Everybody's in the direct sound, and we know that that's that's the preferred thing. Right, and the that reality, other that other that other dispersion uh, picture, by the way, showed the same situation with the speakers on the front wall facing back into the room. Um, right. Like so. And, and I, that's right. And that's the way we went, that's the design we went with for this system because you can imagine now, now everybody's in the direct sound of that speaker again. Um, because you, if you map those, uh, if you extended, mentally extended those uh, gray lines, you would see that uh, you pick up pretty much every, every seat on both couches. Um, and so where there is an opportunity to put put the wide speakers outside the screen on the front wall. It doesn't always happen, but um, then that's the best best thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I forget, where are we headed with this? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're talking about dispersion and and direct sound oh, the aiming. and the sweet yeah. spot and aiming and right, so on. Yeah, Right, right, right. So um, what we're finding in reality is almost nobody... You know, even in twenty thousand square foot, twenty million dollar houses, they don't have the ability to give up the real estate required to aim all the speakers. Um, so, if if you aim all the speakers at the reference listening position and the speakers are visible, then you end up with you know these speakers at all different angles, and it's not visually very attractive. Um, and one way to conceal that would be to use stretch fabric to hide the speakers. But now you've got speakers that are only four inches deep, angled back you know, 60 degrees or something. And so instead of eating up four inches of your room or none of your room because they're built into the wall, now they're going to eat up 12 inches on either side. Mm. And we're just we're just not seeing home uh, theater rooms that are where we're able to aim the speakers. Right. So, uh, and, and in the ceiling, we do the best by using our angled model uh, for the ones that are farthest off axis. But for the ones that are uh, not... Uh, you can't aim and you're far off axis, then remember, we're trying to get the direct sound to be optimized. That's where EQ can be your friend. You have to try to EQ the sound that does arrive at the listening position um, to be more like the on-axis response of the other loudspeakers. But you got to be careful because you're going to end up turning up the treble, essentially, and you got to always be aware that the on axis of those speakers is now going to be bright and you know, it's going to have excessive treble so that mm. you can you can get more of it back to the in the off axis response so you kind of got to balance it a little bit right we have a couple other graphics i want to make sure we show uh, one is called listener 7.1
And this is the same drawing uh, or model uh, from the position or from the point of view of the <laughs> crash test dummy sitting on the couch that we saw in the previous image. That's right. He's on the back couch, and you can see the only speakers in his field of view are left, center, right, and the front subwoofers. Mm -hmm. um, we really didn't have any speakers that were off-axis. And then if we go to the one that's the Atmos... Um, Sidewalls or rear walls? It, well, yeah, there's either. a front. Yeah, so you can see there, now he's got all those speakers way in front of him. Uh, the ones on the ceiling, you can see they're angled. You can see that oval, that's the horn. So he is still uh, in the direct pattern of the horn, thank goodness, even all the way back on the second couch. But um, now, you know, those speakers that are um, on the sidewalls in front of them, you're going to have to uh, try to balance that the sound that goes off axis to the rear couch with the not sending too much high frequency energy into the room on the on the, the you know, the guy standing there, the little dummy that's standing down there, he's going to get too much trouble, right? Mm. But he's not going to, he's too close to be where he should be to watch the movie anyway, right? Yeah, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be standing there or shouldn't be standing there. So, uh, <laughs> but, but, but this is one area where immersive audio uh, does create a need for system, you know, room system compensation. But again, I want to point out, we're talking about adjusting the direct sound where, you know what I mean? We're, we're not mm -hmm. going to be adjusting the sound based on room reflections or anything. We're going to be adjusting the sound that comes direct to the back couch, if you will. Now, I will, I will tell you this, that that picture that we're looking at here with the front wides on the front wall, they still are up, you know, abutting, as you will, if you will, the uh, side walls. So there's going to be a lot of very short, very short time reflections coming off those walls and coming at you, right? So do you have to take that into consideration in this particular case? Yeah, well, there, you would get some low frequency boundary loading from that that you would mm -hmm. need to take into consideration. And hopefully uh, the first reflection would be so quick. And in this case, it probably would. They look like those are only six inches off the wall or something or 10 inches off the wall. The first reflection would come so soon that your ear wouldn't perceive it as a reflection. It would just be integrated into the into the uh, first sound. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, go ahead. I was going to say that the, we have one other picture I wanted to show, uh, which is listener... Uh, at most wide sidewall. Right. So that now you like really that. see how far off axis. Look at how far off axis the dummy in the rear couch is of the left uh, side wide speaker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, he can. He's looking basically at the edge of the speaker. He's almost 90 degrees off axis, like 80 degrees off axis or something. So he's going to get almost no direct sound. Yeah, he, well, he'll get no he'll get high some. frequency direct sound. Yeah, he'll get the direct sound in the lower frequencies, but the tweeter, uh, he's probably not going to get a lot of uh, a lot of like say five k and up, and so and that will rob the rob the sound of uh, articulation and effortlessness and transient leading edge and openness and air and all kinds of stuff. So, so that's a challenging situation, which is exactly why I would prefer to put them on the front wall. Um, and deal with the reflection, you know, deal with the corner loading because now the tweeters are aimed at all the listeners. Mm -hmm. So um, the the bottom line is the Dolby spec is the best way. Aim it, aim everything. Um, and when you can't, then EQ the speakers that are off axis by placing the microphone at the reference listening position and trying to adjust the high frequency balance to match more similarly the measurement you get from uh, a side speaker that is uh, uh, where you are in the direct axis. That's exactly what I do is I, I measure the, the speaker that is aimed right at the couch, the, you know, the surround speaker that's aimed right at the couch, and I measure the one that's way off axis, and I try to bring them more similar. Uh, but I never go the, f the full amount because then you're just going to have too much very high frequency in the room. Right. Right, which, as we talked about last week, you really don't want. <laughs> right. Now, in measuring, uh, one of the things you've said to me offline was that when you're measuring sound levels, you use A weighting. Now, I want to just make sure everybody knows that weighting, when you're measuring sound pressure levels, mm, sort of contours the sensitivity of the measurement. And A weighting basically takes uh, reduces the sensitivity to the low frequencies because humans are less sensitive to low frequencies than they are to high frequencies. 
Um, and that's, in fact, the, the type of measurement, A weighting, that is done to establish reference level in a commercial cinema and, and so on and so forth. But I'm curious to know why you do that. Uh, I, for a long time, used C weighting, because which doesn't reduce the amount of base frequencies in the measurement, uh, because I wanted to get a sense of exactly what was going on. But I'd love to hear your take on, on A weighting. Right. So um, a lot of the consumer processors, um, and they still do, have a band-limited noise signal for the level setting routine. Mm -hmm. And and that really takes the weighting out of it because it's like one octave of energy centered on 1K. And so every speaker is going to get only that one octave on 1K signal. Um, and you could set your meter to flat. It would work just as well um, because it um, is measuring only that one octave of energy. Because um, a sound level meter just takes all the sound arriving at it at any frequency and it, it sums it together to come up with one single sound pressure level calculation. Um, right. So, so the bandwidth matters, right? So um, now some of the more higher end surround processes, the data sat, the turn off, and others, they have a full range pink noise signal uh, uh, in the level setting routine. So when you turn the noise signal on to look at your meter and adjust the level to balance all the channels, um, you're getting a full range uh, pink noise signal. And why I say to use eight weighting and that A weighting in that circumstance is it removes the low frequency bandwidth of the loudspeakers from the equation. So for example, in that, in that system that we looked at in the graphics, that's a 15 inch two-way screen speaker that goes down to 30 Hertz. Mm -hmm. uh, the surround speakers are little double six inch two-way speakers that go down to about 55, 50, 55 Hertz. So if you use C weighting, just the additional base energy in the uh, front speakers are gonna cause it to read much higher on the meter than the side speakers because the side speakers are missing all that bass energy. Mm, so good what, point. So, so what A weighting does for you is it removes that because A weighting prioritizes, you know, where our hearing is most sensitive and, and where voice is. And so two things. Um, one, A weighting removes the bandwidth of the, the loudspeaker from the calculation and prioritizes the mid-range, which is what that band-limited 1K signal is supposed to do, is it's supposed to eliminate the bandwidth of the speaker from the calculation and just give you how loud is it at 1K, which makes sense. We, we want to balance them in the mid-range. So, so the, so the A-weighting you know, takes away the, the bandwidth from the, you know, the varying loudspeaker bandwidth from the equation, and then it also prioritizes where hearing is most sensitive and in my experience, when you when you set the levels with a weighting, the the con continuity of sound as the sounds move from speaker to speaker tends to seem more precise because it's they're all set with the at the most sensitive part of our hearing, so it's easier for us to detect that they're exactly the same level. Does that does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, now, last time, one thing I want to clarify, when I was showing the meter in the X-curve suggestion, I'm suggesting to use C-weighting there because then it does include that extra base we want to be there, right? Really? Um, okay. That's the, let's so, take a look at that again. That's X-curve uh, mod benefit. Yeah, because, and in my, I, I don't know uh, whether they used C or A. If they used A, then we'd end up with the mid-range at the same level as the X-curve, the black curve. Um, mm -hmm. But it would still seem less aggressive because the bass is there. So psychoacoustically, if you have a little more low-frequency energy in your, in your sound, it will make the sound be fuller and smoother and less mid-range forward even if the mid-range levels were the same. So it's still a benefit. But I, if you notice, I have DBC on the graphic there. That's what I meant. Mm -hmm. um, that's what the, the DBC would force that red line below the black line in the mid-range because of the fact that the red line's above the black line on the left. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Um, right, because the, the, so the red line, which is the, the final result of the measurement, um, you'd need to use DBC in order to get that, the low end to be higher 
as it is included uh, included in the in the SPL number. Yeah, D, D, right. DBA or yeah, A weighting would would exclude the low frequencies essentially. So right. um, I probably should have provided a, a weighting graph, but I didn't I didn't think about it. Um, so so we, we did get into trouble in the home theater business when these more professional style processors hit because they had the full range pink noise and most uh, you know integrators didn't realize that. Yeah, they they were taught to use DBC with the band limited noise signal because it didn't matter. But in full, you know, in in the with the full range pink noise, you you want to remove the low frequency bandwidth uh, response of different kinds of speakers from the calculation. When you're when you're setting levels in a room, is what you're saying. When you yeah, when you're setting the channel levels, that's right. Uh, but still, you want to. Do you also want to, when, uh, or an integrator say wants to set up a system? Would they want to measure in C to make sure they're getting uh, the proper response in the low frequencies? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, you, if you wanted to, you know, if we are trying to measure the maximum SPL of the system when it's playing, I, I remember Scott, you were at a CDA and I was measuring 110 dB. Mm -hmm. That was that 110 dB was 110 dB C, and it wouldn't have been nearly that high a number if it was dBA. Right. Typically, so, so, typically I get when I I investigate this quite a bit, and I typically get roughly roughly a 10 dB difference between C and A. That's right, uh, and that's probably about what we see too. So yeah, it was about 105 peak, which means we were playing at reference, right? Uh, right. It's loud. It's loud. Um, it's very loud. And, and it, and if you don't have extra bass in there, it's not only very loud, it's very loud and it's not very pleasing tonal. You know, the tonal balance is not pleasing. It's kind of yeah. an aggressive tonal balance as opposed to a uh, full, robust sound that doesn't leave you fatigued. Right. Um, so so you know, while we're on the topic, and I don't, I don't want to run out of time, let's talk about the, the bass management um, that we had those surround subwoofers uh, in the graphics, and either any of those graphics uh, would show the subs, either the movie or um, yeah. Go or ahead and show uh, dispersion wide front. So what we're suggesting here is because we have these smaller loudspeakers, and the sidewall speakers are actually full range. They they could be set. Well, that's not totally true either. They 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 have response down to about fifty or so. The ceiling speakers that are the small ceiling speakers, the six in the middle, that's a little five inch two way loudspeaker. So, you know, a five inch woofer just um, you know has restricted low frequencies. It's a very high output speaker, so that if we base manage manage those to local subs, which is what we do here, uh, those larger boxes, the two on the left and the right walls, um, then they can be extremely dynamic because they're re relieved of having to do any kind of low frequency. Um, right. That's that's the purpose of base management to begin with. Right. And the reason why we wouldn't want to base manage them to the big subs in the front is you'd be able to tell. You would hear right. all the low frequency energy coming from the front wall and you'd be your your surround information would sound kind of anemic. But when you can get local subwoofers, what we would do, so if you look at the two speakers above the dummy in the rear couch, we would base manage both of those to that right, or it would be his left, the left rear subwoofer. Right. And then the two the two side channels that are on either side of that sub, they would be base managed. The, the rear one would be base managed to the rear sub, and then the one that's kind of middle way between the two subs, we'd base manage that to both of those subs. Hmm. And so the same thing on the front wall. We base manage the left to the left sub, the right to the right sub, and the center channel to both subs. And mm -hmm. and we do it uh, very sp um, frequency specific based on the loudspeaker model. So uh, it's not just everything's 80 hertz. We we don't want to do that. We want to, we want to take advantage of the bandwidth of the speaker as much as possible, and just redirect the energy that is that the speaker cannot produce to the sub. So like the side speakers, we would base manage at 50 or so. The ceiling speakers, we base manage at 80. And the fronts, we would base manage at 30. So, I mean, only only content below 30 would go to the to the subwoofer. To so the front subwoofer. So really what the you're front, saying right. is you want multiple subwoofers so that you can base manage the nearby surround or front speakers to that or those subs because of the directionality that we were talking about earlier. 
That's right. And when you do that, you do get a surround field that is full range. It's, you know, you perceive the full range sound of all the sound effects coming from where it's supposed to be coming from. And the, the secondary benefit, and this is not insignificant, this is a huge benefit, is it helps with minimizing the excitation of standing waves. So if you can energize the room in multiple locations, um, your chances of kind of smoothing out the sound field are much greater because they all they all interact with different standing waves differently. And if, if you're sitting in a null from one subwoofer, uh, the chances are one of the other subwoofers isn't going to have a null there. And so you get some energy that you wouldn't otherwise get. So right. it's, it's twofold. Um, but it requires a processor that can do that. Um, uh, so uh, the good thing about the, the turnoff is it has very sophisticated base management that, that lets us do exactly that. And we can mix LFE in there too. So we end up with some LFE in each of the surround subs, and it's usually down and level relative to the um, the front, uh, because we want the bulk of the energy to come from where the image is. Yeah, you know, we don't want the kick drum in the chair, right? Um, right. <laughs> so, so it'll have LFE content. Each subwoofer will have LFE content, but typically six dB down from the level of the fronts, uh, plus the bass management, which will be unique to each each sub and each speaker. So you end up with a lot of base management going on. Um, yeah, yeah. As but, you but say, sophisticated powerful. base management. Right. So, yeah, and, it's and, very valuable. You know, the Trinoff can do that, but it's also, you know, it costs five figures, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's the the challenge here is everything I'm talking about is, is an expensive solution. So, uh, for, um, you know, more affordable solutions, all these principles can be applied. The quantity would probably be more limited. Uh, some... Right. Some uh, surround processors have two subwoofer outputs. Um, some have four, um, and so you can you can still do it. You just won't be able to do it with as high a resolution uh, as the as the five six figure systems we're talking about. Right, right. Well, uh, listen, it's been really great. Thank you so much for being here uh, for a second week in a row to uh, share with us more of your insight into uh, pretty high end home theaters. But I think. Even though we've been talking about very high-end home theaters, they, the the principles that you're talking about can be brought down into the real world for for many more people, uh, and certainly worth considering. Uh, so thanks a lot for being here. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. I hope it's valuable for all the listeners. And uh, you know, I can't believe you invited me back for a second week in a row. You must be a glutton for punishment or something. <laughs> but, uh, it was, it was well, fun there were just so many good stuff. Again. Yeah, there's yeah, so much good, good stuff to talk about. So thank you so yeah. much. That's uh, Paul Hales uh, from uh, Pro Audio Technology. His website is professionalhomecinema.com. So be sure to go there for uh, much more information. You can find me at avsforum.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv. And you can follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott and at avsforum. You can always find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks, including last week's, which you'll want to check out if you're watching this show or listening to this show, uh, at twit.tv slash htg and on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash twit home theater geeks. Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be Mark Shubin. He's a television technologist and he's going to be here to discuss his views on a wide variety of topics regarding television, including some really interesting stuff on the early history of television. So I do hope you will join me for that. He's a very entertaining guy, too. So please join us. I'm sure you will enjoy it. Until then, geek out. <laughs>